and welcome back. I hope everybody had a good Christmas, or as they say in the secular world, a happy holiday. <laughs> Is it insane or what? I mean, the world's gone crazy, but then we should expect that. Without Christ, you do go crazy. And some of us, even with Christ, are a little crazy. We are continuing our survey of the Bible. The Bible begins with the book of Genesis, a book in which we're told about the creation of the heavens and the earth. The Bible ends with the book of Revelation and tells us about the destruction of this heaven and earth and the creation of a new one and a glorious eternity future for those who know Christ. The Bible is divided into an Old Testament and a New Testament. The Old Testament begins with creation and it ends with the Jews returning from the Babylonian captivity and rebuilding the wall around Jerusalem. Between the end of the Old Testament and the beginning of the New Testament is about a 400-year span of time. The New Testament begins with uh, the announcements of the birth of uh, John the Baptist and Jesus Christ. It tells us about their births and in particular the ministry and crucifixion, burial and resurrection of Jesus Christ. The New Testament ends with the book of Revelation where we're told that God is going to create a new heaven and a new earth and usher in a glorious future. We have been working our way through the Old Testament. In fact, we've spent almost a year working our way through the Old Testament. And we haven't gotten real far, but we're going to speed it up, Lord willing. The Old Testament's made up of four groups of books. The Pentateuch, the books of history, the books of poetry, and the books of prophecy. The Pentateuch is uh, the first five books of the Bible, also called the Torah or the Book of Moses. In the Pentateuch, we read about... The creation, about Adam and Eve sinning, about the flood, the Tower of Babel, uh, God calling Abraham out of Ur of the Chaldees and promising to make of him a great nation and blessing the world through him. And we, as we work our way through the Pentateuch, we learn about Abraham's son Isaac and then Jacob and then the whole family ending up down in Egypt. And uh, then how they grew to become a nation of two to three million people and were miraculously delivered from slavery wandered around the wilderness for 40 years, and uh, finally the Pentateuch ends with the children of Israel on the banks of the Jordan River getting ready to go in to conquer the land of Canaan. When we last were here, we discussed the last book of the Pentateuch, the book of Deuteronomy, a book in which Moses gathered everybody together for one last sermon. It's I always think of that as, as a father getting his his rebel son together in his study before the son goes off to college. Now, the father knows this son's going to get in a lot of trouble, so he pleads with him to be a good guy and to follow the rules because he loves his son. He loves him, and that's the situation with Moses. They really mistreated Moses badly. I mean, they really mistreated him over the 40 years. He really, they gave him a lot of grief. But he loved them. He was willing to die for them. And so he gathers them around and says, guys, let me tell you what the deal is. If you're disobedient when you go into the land of Canaan, God's going to curse you. But if you're obedient, God is going to bless you more than any nation on this earth. Just be obedient. Throw away those false gods from Egypt. Worship the one true God. Follow the rules. You'll be blessed. But he says, I know you won't. <laughs> and, uh, but anyway, God made a promise to Abraham. He's going to make him a great nation anyway and rule the world through him. So even though you're going to be disobedient, you're going to be punished, and he talked about the two dispersions, nevertheless, God is going to one day give you a heart that believes. And one day, God will, and it will be midpoint in the tribulation. God's going to take him out in the desert of what's modern-day Jordan, Ammon, Moab, and Edom in the Old Testament era. And there God is going to sift them, give them the heart to believe. Their nation is going to turn, return to the Lord finally as a nation, so much so that when Jesus returns, a third of the nation will be there to welcome him. Glorious time. So God promised to do all these things. He made It was a promise, unconditional promise to Abraham. But what Moses was talking about at the end of the Pentateuch in that book of Deuteronomy were the conditional promises. We live with unconditional promises and conditional promises. That's true for all of us. God has his unconditional promise. It was like the Abrahamic covenant. If you embrace Christ as your Savior, 
your sins are forgiven, you're born again into the kingdom of God, your future is secure. That's his unconditional promise. I don't have to worry about that because he's going to see that it's taken care of. If it was dependent upon me, I'd be in deep trouble. <laughs> A few nervous laughters over there. But it's totally dependent upon him because God is faithful. Over and over and over, over throughout the scriptures, he keeps talking about how faithful he is. That's good. You know, he wants us to know that he will do what he promises to do. But we also have conditional promises. God says, come walk with me, and I'll bless your life. And he's not talking about uh, uh, health and wealth. What he's talking about is a glorious life walking with the king. There's nothing better. I was young, and now I'm old, and I can tell you, the only things I regret in my life were the things I did apart from God. Walking with the king is the greatest privilege this world has to offer. You say, oh, you're sounding real spiritual. I'm telling you, folks, that's it. When I think about the things I regret in life, there are a lot of things I regret. The things I regret was when I was disobedient to the king. When I'm walking with the king, that's, that's the stuff of life. That's what makes life is. And that's what he was trying to get them to do. Walk with the king and be a blessing and be blessed. Well, anyway, as you know, he died and... We're getting ready now to go into the books of history. We ended there this past fall. And uh, as you probably noticed from your notes, we're going to be studying the books of history. They pick up where the Pentateuch left off. There are 12 books of history, Joshua through Esther. Joshua is named after the man who became the leader of Israel when Moses died. He was commissioned just before Moses died. He was the general that led the children of Israel across the Jordan River into the land of Canaan and led the Israelites, General Joshua did, in their seven-year conquest of Canaan. Now, this is a conquest in which they were able to conquer and destroy enough of the city-states in Canaan to gain a foothold in the ground and then settle down and start to build a nation. They didn't necessarily destroy all of the Canaanites, and there are a number of reasons for that. But this book of Joshua talks about the conquest of Canaan, that, that seven-year period during which Joshua led them into Canaan to conquer it so they could settle down and start building a nation. The book of books of Judges and Ruth tell us about the following 350 years when they were ruled by judges. And uh, this was not good years. The, there was one little phrase that sort of describes that 350-year period, and that phrase, all of you know about it, everyone did that which was right in his own eyes. Ah, sort of like us. Well, have you ever talked to people? Well, let me tell you what I think about God. I don't care what you think about God. What does God say about God? You know, people... They, they build their religious life on what they think God should be. They live their lives in the way they think their lives should be lived. Now, some of them live pretty decent moral lives. Some live, Im live immoral lives. But that's not the issue. We shouldn't be doing what's right in our own eyes. We should be doing what's right in God's eyes. He made it, folks. He sets the rules. In any event, they did that which was right in their own eyes. And uh, it, things were not good. And so finally, after 350 years, they said to the, the last great judge, Samuel, we want to be like the nations around us. We want a king. And so the book of 1 Samuel talks about their first king, King Saul. Now, there's some overlapping here, but I'm just trying to give you the basic sense of a book. So if you say, I want to learn about Saul, you don't go over and read the book of Ezra. <laughs> and you really don't even read the book of Judges. You go to 1 Samuel. And it talks about the reign of King Saul a king after their own heart. Give us a king. God says, I'm fine, I'll give you one just like yourself, a disaster. And there's, a, there's, a, there's some information here that you should carry with you. God tends to give us kings, presidents, after our own hearts. If you read the 13th chapter of, Revel of, of Romans, it talks about how God establishes all the rulers in the world. It makes it very clear. And people say, well, why are you giving us all these lousy rulers? Because you're lousy. It's not hard to figure. You say, we've got a lot of bad rulers you've been giving us, Lord. Well, look at yourself. If you were better people, you'd get better kings. So they were not a good people. And so God gave them a king after their own hearts. Then he says, I've had it with that. I'm going to give you a king after my heart. Ah, long came David. And uh, then... He gave them Solomon, and then when Solomon died, and you read about 
David, uh, Saul in 1 Samuel, read about David in 2 Samuel. Then the books of 1 and 2 Kings tell us about the reign of Saul, Solomon. When Solomon died, his son Rehoboam ascended the throne. And most of you know the story. The uh, men and women in Israel came to him and says, Rehoboam, please lighten up. Your dad had these massive building projects in which he was conscripting us into forced labor, which is a very common thing back then. That's how they built the pyramids. So the Jews, I'm sure, were familiar with conscripted labor. And he was taxing them to death for all these fancy building projects, something God told them that, that they, would, they were going to have a problem with if they wanted kings. But they wanted a king, so this is what they got. Anyway, they said, Rehoboam, lighten up. We've been taxed to death. We're, we're tired of forced labor. Uh, and Rehoboam went to his father's elderly friends, and his elderly friends said, listen to the people. And then he went to his drinking buddies, and that's really all they were, his party guys. You know, they, people, and they said, hey, tell, go back and tell the people you're going to be worse than your dad. Politically dumb, because the ten northern tribes then said, drop dead, we're leaving. And they formed their own nation. From that point on, there was a northern kingdom and a southern kingdom. northern kingdom had ten tribes, the southern kingdom had... Two tribes, and uh, <coughs> there were 19 kings in the north. All of them were terrible with nine dynasties. The southern kingdom only had one dynasty. They had the same number of kings, 19 kings, but they at least had a few good ones. And uh, at any event, the northern uh, Israel, both north and south, was pretty bad. And you also have to keep in mind that throughout this period of time, uh, they were idolatrous. But the children of Israel have been idolaters throughout their history. They were idolaters when they were wandering around in the wilderness. In a sh few, few minutes, we're going to be talking about Joshua. And Joshua's last message to the people was, put away your idols. It's not that they worshipped their idols exclusive of Jehovah. They were polytheistic. That was the culture of the day. Everybody knew that there were a variety of gods. Everybody knew that. That was common knowledge. Listen to me. Listen to me. Like everybody knows that we evolve, right? Everyone, we all know that. Don't let the culture define God. Sadly, we've done that, even in evangelical circles. People come in with a view of God that's been established by the culture out there. If you do that, you're in deep trouble because they don't know who God is. The culture is run by Satan, not Jehovah. You better let the Bible define God for you. So anyway, they were all polytheistic. And so they did worship Jehovah, but they worshiped these false gods. And finally, God had a, had, he couldn't deal with it anymore. And in 722, the Assyrians conquered the ten northern tribes, and they ceased to be a nation. The southern kingdom lasted a little bit longer, but uh, eventually they had their day with the Babylonians. The Babylonians conquered the Assyrians and became, in 612, and became the big Gentile powers in the Middle East. And they conquered the southern kingdom in 605 again in 597. And finally, because Israel kept rebelling in 586, the Babylonians conquered the southern kingdom, destroyed Jerusalem, destroyed the temple, and it took essentially everybody back to Babylon in captivity. And where do we read about this? In First and Second Kings. First and Second Chronicles are the two books that follow First and Second Kings. And First and Second Chronicles retells much of the story that was told in Second Samuel, just a touch of First Samuel, Second Samuel, and First and Second Kings. So this is a repeat. The children of Israel are off in Babylon for 70 years. They returned, and in the books of Book of Ezra, we read about their return and rebuilding the temple. And Ezra, that's Ezra chapters 1 through 6. And Ezra 7 through 10, we read about a revival that took, some, uh, took place some more than 50 years after that. And then the book of Nehemiah tells us about the Jews rebuilding their wall after they returned from the Babylonian captivity, leaving one last book in the books of history, the book of Esther. The book of Esther tells us about an event that took place among the Jews that didn't return. Israel was a nation of a couple of million people. When they were carried away into captivity, both captivities, the Assyrian and the Babylonian, uh, most of the people stayed in captivity. In fact, we have a word to describe Israel in captivity, Israel outside the land. It's called the diaspora. And the truth of the matter is, most Jews never return. And uh, that's always been sort of the case. They just stay outside the land where their blessing is. In any event, Esther is a story of an event that took place among the diaspora, those Jews that were still off in Mesopotamia. These, then, are the books of history. 
Joshua, Judges, Ruth, 1 and 2 Samuel, 1 and 2 Kings, 1 and 2 Chronicles, Ezra, Nehemiah, Esther. These books tell us about the history of Israel from the time of the conquest up until the time the Jews rebuilt the wall following the Babylonian captivity. And if you want to read the rest of Israel's history until the time of Christ, you won't find it in the Bible because this is the, this is 400, we call them 400 silent years. But there are other books in the Old Testament, books of poetry, books of prophecy. Those books go back into these years that have already been covered by the Pentateuch and the books of history. The books of poetry tell us about the hearts and the minds of the men and women who lived during that era. And the books of prophecy tell us about uh, the heart and mind of God during those years. So for all practical purposes, if you read the Pentateuch and the books of history, you get the whole history from creation up until the time the Jews returned from the Babylonian captivity and rebuilt the wall around Jerusalem. Now, with that little bit of an introduction to the books of history, uh, let's start with the book of Joshua. That's the first of the books. And uh, when we closed our study in the fall uh, with the book of Deuteronomy, the children of Israel were camped on the plains of Moab, which was on the eastern side of the Jordan River, just north of the Dead Sea. That's where we left them. And uh, Moses died. Joshua has been commissioned. And Joshua is going to lead the children of Israel into the land of Canaan. He was, as I pointed out, that Joshua was the successor. And the book of Joshua is named after him. He was commissioned to lead Israel shortly uh, after uh, just shortly before Moses died. Joshua is an interesting man. He's one of those great men. He had been with Israel from the very beginning. He was a slave with the rest of the Jews in Egypt prior to the Exodus. He was uh, Moses' assistant throughout the 40 years. He, he, came, he was with Moses in Egypt. He, he, he came with the rest of Israel uh, to the Sinai during the time of the great exodus. He became Moses' assistant. He was one of the 12 spies. We all remember we studied the 12 spies. 12 spies went in. Uh, they remember after, after going, after the great exodus, they went down to Sinai, southern uh, Mount Sinai, which is in the southern Sinai Peninsula, and they met with God, and they got the law, they built the tabernacle, they learned the rules and regulations that they were supposed to follow as a nation. Then they went up to Kadesh Barnea. Two years have passed now. They're ready to go into the land of Canaan. They sent the 12 spies in, and they all came back and said, the land is the land of milk and honey, uh, but there are great giants in there and a lot of fortified, fortified cities. And 10 of the spies said, don't go in. We're afraid for our children. She yeah, right. Children. That's a sp Talk about spin control. Spin control isn't new, is it? <laughs> Men have been making excuses for their own cowardice since the beginning of time. And that's all it was. They were afraid for themselves. And I'm sure they were afraid for the kids, but mostly they're afraid for themselves. But Joshua and Caleb said, it's true, fortified cities, and it's true. They're giants. But so what? Folks, have you forgotten what we just left? The most powerful nation on the earth at that time was Egypt. And God miraculously delivered us from the most powerful nation in the world, in the world at that time. Destroyed their army. It's been feeding us miraculously. It's not like you have to guess about God existing. He made himself real every single day for, for, for that two years. For those, that, that two years. But anyway, as you, most of you recall, the people decided to uh, follow the advice of the ten spies who gave the bad report. And so God said, fine. I'll tell you what you do. You're afraid for the kids. I'm going to let your kids grow up. They'll go in and kill those giants you're afraid to kill. So you'll wander for another 38 years. And, and the pronouncement God made was this. During this 30 years, everybody 20 years of age and older will die. And those children you're afraid for, they're going to grow up and go kill the giants. There's tremendous irony here. Except for two individuals. Joshua and Caleb, who gave the great report. So they're the only two adults who had been slaves in Egypt who were allowed to enter the land of Canaan. We're going to be talking about Caleb a little later. For right now, we're going to focus on Joshua because he was the man who was commissioned to be the leader. Caleb was remarkable. I mean, his this 85-year-old man says, give me another mountain to climb some more giants to kill. <laughs> and that fits in with the message this morning, which is don't retire. The motto is, throw your golf clubs in the Susquehanna. <laughs> All right, here we are. The book of Joshua was named after Moses' successor. Joshua had been 
that Israel from the very beginning, he had been a slave in Egypt. He had been Moses' assistant. He was one of the 12 spies. His name means Jehovah saves. That's the Hebrew form, jo Joshua or Yeshua. In Greek, it's Jesus. Isn't that lovely? God just throws all these little things in there. I love it. Now, Joshua's military strategy was to cross the, the Jordan River from the plains of Moab, just north of Jericho, then go down and conquer Jericho, shoot across the land, then, and then um, campaign. He wanted to conduct some military campaigns south and then military campaigns north. This is the way it would have worked. Uh, Joshua said they were, they were keep, the Israelites were camped right here on the plain of Moab, and the plan was to cross the Jordan River just north of Jericho, knock out Jericho because that was a strategic city uh, there on the eastern on the western side of the Jordan River, cut across Canaan, then move south, then move north. Now the reason for that was this. Had they decided to come from the south and work their way up, all of these city-states in Canaan could have formed a great coalition. It would have been no more difficult to defeat them. Keep in mind that Canaan was not a single country. It was a piece of land uh, that measured about 120, 150 miles long, was maybe roughly 50 miles wide. It was not a big, big country but it wasn't a single nation. There were dozens and dozens and dozens of cities scattered throughout Canaan from Beersheba in the south to Dan in the north. And each of those cities was its own sovereign country with its own king. We call them city-states. City-states were kind of the rule at this time in history. Egypt was different because of the Nile River, and we discussed that some months ago. It flooded at particular times, and, they, they, and, and, and the Egyptian astronomers knew when it was going to flood, so it gave the, the, um, the authorities in Egypt a certain control over the people because they could tell the people when their god, the Nile River, was going to flood, when it was not, and all that business. So the, the, Egypt was a little bit different, but e Canaan was city-states. And what uh, the Israelites would have to do was go in there and conquer each one of those city-states. But what Joshua didn't want was to have to fight a coalition of all of them. So he said, what we're going to do is we're going to cut across the center of Canaan, and then we'll move south. And when they did go south, there were five city-state kings who did form a coalition against them, but that was a whole lot better than those five in the south and five or ten or twenty in the north. So the idea was to cut across the midsection of Canaan, then uh, execute military campaigns to the south, then military campaigns to the north. That's the strategy. So the book of Joshua was named after Moses' successor. It was, uh, Joshua had been with them since the beginning. His name means Jehovah saves. We've talked about his military strategy. And a conquest of Canaan took about seven years. And it's important to note that it was not total, even though they were able to gain a strong foothold in Canaan. There were still city-states they had not conquered. Now, part of that was God's desire because he said that if you conquer all of them, drive them all out, the land will not be managed well. In fact, we read about it in Exodus. God said, I will not drive them all. He's talking about the Canaanites. I will not drive them out in a single year because the land will become desolate and, and the wild animals too numerous for you. Little by little, I will drive them out before you until you have increased enough to take possession of the land. So the idea was to take it a piece at a time. Unfortunately, the Israelites quit taking it a piece at a time. The, God wanted them to, 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 to go in and conquer an, enough of those city-states to gain a foothold and become the big dog. And they did. They became the, became the ruling power in Canaan. But there were still cities of Canaanites over there, each sovereign, cities, states over there, city-states up there. And uh, God wanted those city-states to remain because that meant that the people there would still be farming the land. It wouldn't become wild, and they would control the wild animals and all that sort of thing. But eventually he wanted them to go and conquer all those city-states because he said, if you don't, you're going to be caught up in their idolatry, which, of course, is what happened. They, they quit 
uh, conquering all those city-states, and, and then the people became entrapped. And we'll talk more about that when we get to the book of Judges. The land was divided after those seven years of conquest and assigned to the tribes. And it looks something like this. Some of the larger tribes got more, some of the smaller tribes got less. If you recall, when we were in, in uh, the Pentateuch, we talked about how the children of Israel came up through around Edom and Moab and conquered uh, two of the kings on the eastern side of the Jordan River. King Og of Bashan and uh, Sihon, uh, who was a king of the Amorites. So what they had done is the Israelites, when they first came out of the desert up into the eastern side of the Jordan River, they knocked out two of the major kings in this area, and then there were two of the tribes that said, we like this land, we'd like to stay here. We talked about that a little bit last fall. So the tribe of Reuben, the tribe of Gad, and, the tribe, and half of the tribe of Manasseh took possession of land on the eastern side of the Jordan River. Uh, the other half of the tribe was given land on the western side. This was a large uh, tribe. Naphtali, Asher, Zebulun, Issachar, Ephraim, Dan, Benjamin, Judah, and then Simeon uh, took land on the uh, western side of the Jordan. So the land was, dis was divided among the tribes. The one tribe you don't see here is Levi. The Levites didn't get any land assignments. What they did get was 48 cities scattered throughout the region. And the, one of the reasons for that was God said to the Levites, I'm your share. Also, which, which is a great honor. What's the, do you want a piece of land or you want God? God made the Levites the tribe from which he drew the priests. These were the men who carried, uh, that took care of the tabernacle later on the temple. And eventually they became a lot of priests. In fact, at the time of Jesus, there were thousands. And they had to divide up each, each in, the, in, the, in two divisions. So you just, you only, you got to, to, to serve in the temple uh, what, two weeks out of the year. And remember Zechariah? He was a priest, father of, of, of uh, John the Baptist. And uh, he uh, had the privilege of offering up incense. And there were so many priests, you only got to do it once in your lifetime. And so when he went into the temple to offer up the incense, the angel came to him and told him about the birth of John the Baptist. So I'll only tell you about this to let you know that they were tremendously honored because these men became the priests. But there was also another reason why God wanted them spread throughout the land. These were the men who were the keepers of the law. These were the men who were keepers of the religious rituals in Israel. These were God's religious servants. And, God, and they were supposed to be the teachers in Israel. God wanted them not just to be hanging out in one little tribe by themselves. He wanted them to scatter, be scattered throughout the kingdom. So they had cities scattered throughout all the other tribes in Israel because he wanted them to be available to everyone in Israel to teach them about the law. So the land was divided and assigned to the tribes. The Levites were not assigned a particular region. They were given 48 cities scattered throughout. The author of the book of Joshua is believed to be Joshua, though some portions were almost certainly added by other authors. Now, about major events in the book of Joshua that we'll be talking about. The first major event is an event that took place early in the book of Joshua. And I try to take these things chronologically, so as you're reading the book of Joshua along with the lectures, uh, you can just, uh, the lectures will follow, you should follow your reading pretty well. The first major event is uh, uh, that of Rahab the harlot who lived in Jericho. And uh, jo Joshua's conquest of Canaan began when he sent two spies into the land of Canaan, and in particular, into particular Jericho, because that was a critical city to conquer if they were going to cut across the center section of Canaan. And uh, so he, he said, I want you to go and, and search out the land because he was a generally wanted to know what he was up against. And in particular, go to Jericho because that's the first major city. It's a critical city if we're going to cut across the midsection of Canaan. And so they did go to Jericho, but they were recognized. And people sort of knew that the, these, these weren't natives of the land. And pretty much everybody knew that this giant, you don't hide a nation of two to three million people in the Middle East. People knew they were there. And uh, King Agabation and uh, Sihon of the Amorites 
everybody knew that the Israelites had destroyed them, and those were, those were major powers on the eastern side of the Jordan River. So everybody knew that the Israelites were coming, so they were probably on the lookout for spies. And uh, they, were, they were spotted, but hidden by a harlot named Rahab. And she's an extraordinary woman. Not because harlotry is extraordinary, but because she, just based on rumors, embraced Jehovah, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Her testimony is staggering. Every time I read it, I think of this country and how we have rejected, the bulk of the, bulk of the people in this country and in the Western world have rejected the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Yet we have a Bible. We have the Jews to confirm their existence. We have all these things available, and we reject. All she had to go on was a rumor. We know about you guys. We know about God, your God. And, and remember, this is a polytheistic. Just because she was talking about their God doesn't mean that she didn't at, at some point worship her own gods. You're talking about a world that was polytheistic. It's just so we've heard about your God, how he parted the Dead Sea, and how he gave you victory and he took care of you. Somehow through the whole deal, she said, I believe in your God. He's the sovereign ruler of the universe. And uh, so she said, I'll take care of you. And uh, she was a remarkable woman, so remarkable. In fact, we've talked, I think, on a number of occasions about the 11th chapter of Hebrews, God's Hall of Fame. Now, I'm not, I don't want you to think that, that that's all the men and women who are in God's Hall of Fame, but the book of Hebrews lists some. And God says, these were great men and women of faith. And one of the things I love about God's Hall of Fame is he lists people you wouldn't think would be in there. This gives hope for the rest of us. But he lists people you wouldn't think would be there. And he lists none of their flaws. All he's concerned about are their virtues. Two women are listed there. Sarah, wife of Abraham, mother of the whole Jewish nation. And Rahab. We'll get to that later. So God thought very highly of her. The second issue is we'll talk about their crossing, which was exciting. They walked, they crossed the, the Jordan River at flood season on dry land, a little reminiscent of the uh, Reed Sea. And then there was the conquest of Jericho, which was an exciting one. All they had to do was walk around it seven days, and the walls came tumbling down. I wish all war, wars had fought that way. And we got a bunch of generals in the Marine Corps feel the same way, too. And then after that, <coughs> they went up and attacked a city which was northeast of Jericho, which is a little nothing city. They said, we only need a couple of 3,000 guys to go up. The spies went and checked it out, and they were sorely defeated, the Israelites were. Why? Because there was sin in the camp. We'll talk about that. And then God said to the children of Israel, when you go into Canaan, I want you to kill everybody. 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 Men, women, children, the whole schmear. Don't make peace treaties with them. And there was a group of people called the Gibeonites who uh, lived in a city that was about 20 miles west of Jericho, looked at this whole situation and said, we're in big trouble with this nation. So they pretended to be a people from a long, long way away, a distant land, they said. We're from a distant land. And they came in shabby clothes with moldy bread like they'd been traveling for months to visit with Israel. And they said, just in case there's a problem in the future, we'd like to make a peace treaty with you. Now, God had told the Israelites, don't make any peace treaty with the folks in Canaan. But from a distant land, that's fine. If they want to recognize Jehovah, that's good. And Israel's mistake was they didn't talk to God about it. It's sort of like Ai. Joshua said, go on up and t nail it. They got whipped. One thing, worst person he didn't check with was whom? God. And what was sort of interesting is the one time in the Bible God told a person not to pray. Really. When the Israelites were defeated at, J at, at Ai, J Joshua started praying. And God said, get up. You got sin in the camp. There's something else we got to do right now. And that is you better deal with the sin. And uh, so Joshua is a great guy, but he, he, and it's a great lesson here. And I wish I would learn this lesson. <laughs> Check with God before you do something. Major. I'm not talking about a parking place. I, I, I grew up in an era where people prayed for parking places. I was, I didn't, really, it was, the 70s were wacky, let's face it. I'm a 70s guy, so be nice to me. 
But what happened was he didn't check. He checked with God. God would have said, the sin in the camp, don't go up there. If, God, if, if they had checked with God about the Gibeonites, they would have found that these people were lying to them. But good news came out of it. The Gibeonites, they, they, it said they made this treaty with Israel. And then the Israelites found out they'd lied to them, but they'd made this treaty. And God said, you've made a treaty. You promised not to bother them. You can't do it. But rather than being a sore spot in their side, the Gibeonites, so what Joshua did was this. He said, I'll tell you what, we're not going to destroy you, but you're going to have to chop wood and carry water for us and in particular for the tabernacle for the rest of your lives. You're going to be indentured servants, which led to the Gibeonites being confronted with Jehovah on a daily basis, and they bought into him. And eventually he moved the whole tabernacle to their city. And, well, we'll learn about God's grace. In the midst of it, you're going to see God's grace work its way through all of this. God says, I want you to go and destroy him, but I'm going to, allow, I'm going to, I'm going to exercise grace. He, grace for Rahab and actually grace for the Gibeonites. So they're going to keep popping up. In fact, they popped up again when King Saul, the bad king, broke the treaty and went and killed a bunch of Gibeonites. It cost him the life of seven of his own sons under King David. So God doesn't take kindly to the folks who lie. And then there was Caleb's remarkable request. Caleb, remember, was the Joshua and Caleb guy, the duo who went in and gave the good report. Caleb's 85 years old. They're dividing up the land, and he says, God promised me a big chunk of land 38 years ago when I came, we were camped at Kadesh Barnea, and I came back with a good report. Uh, and I know he said basically what the conversation was about was this. There is some mountain country where Hebron is located, and giants live there. I'm ready to climb a mountain and, and slay some giants. And he did at 85. He didn't retire. He threw his golf clubs in the Susquehanna. <laughs> I'm going to get to you. Got to you. And then finally there's Joshua's farewell address. A wonderful farewell address, a farewell address in which he said, he just brings them in. It was much like Moses in Deuteronomy. Moses in Deuteronomy, we've talked about it, he loved the Israelites. He loved them. He loved them with the heart of God. God loves them, just like he loves the world. And he, Joshua said, folks, be obedient, and God's going to bless you. Throw away it. Your false gods, the gods you brought out of Egypt, they were still worshiping them. They were worshiping Jehovah too. But keep in mind the polytheistic. If you don't understand the polytheism, the Old Testament will make no sense religiously because you'll see them worshiping Jehovah and going to the temple and celebrating Jehovah. That was their particular god. But they also wanted to worship other people's gods to cover all the bases. So like some people today, they want to cover all the bases. And we know what I'm talking about. I'll bring that video in. They're becoming ecumenical today. Like all, we all worship the same God? No, we don't. What's the first commandment? If we all worship the same God, only he just comes to us in different ways with different names, why is there a first commandment? Think about it. First we had no other gods, which means there must be other gods. False gods, to be sure, but people, there aren't, if, if all gods are just the same God with different names and if all roads lead to the same God, why would there be a first commandment? That's the most important one. No other God. So Joshua brings them in. He says, guys, he, he has a couple of chapters, his last farewell address. He loves these people, but he knows they're up to no good. And his big his feel is, choose this day who you will worship. But as for me and my house, what? Oh, what a great sermon that was. All right. So those are the things we're going to be talking about. Um... As, as I pointed out, his strategy was to cut across the central portion of Canaan so they could divide it into two sections. And then he executed military campaigns to the south and military campaigns to the north. Uh, I'll tell you what we'll do. We'll stop here and pick up next week with the story of Rahab, a truly remarkable woman. You, what I, I can never get over is this woman bought into worship Jehovah based on rumors. No Bible, 
no manuscripts, no four spiritual laws, no preacher. And I'm not putting down four spiritual laws. It's just that we have all this material available to us. And we reject it. I'm saying we as a society, because we, we as a society have it. I think you all understand that. And here's a woman who just had some rumors, just rumors. Caravans going through. She hadn't gone down to the, the Sinai to see the Israelites in camp, but she just heard rumors. But the Holy Spirit moved on her heart. See, there's the key. There's the key. God's Holy Spirit took those rumors about this interesting people who, who left slavery in Egypt. And, and wow, the, the Red Sea party, probably some people thought that's a little bit fanciful. But then they were wandering around the, the wilderness for all those years, 40 years in the wilderness. And then there were some kings on the eastern side of the Jordan River. They destroyed. All she gets is some rumors in a polytheistic world. And I'm sure there were guys in the hometown of Jericho saying, well, we got some powerful gods too. I mean, we're a pretty big, powerful city, so you know they've whipped a bunch of guys to get there. But just based on those rumors, when these spies came through, I'm going to protect you, and I worship your God. I'm casting my lot in with you. She put her whole life on the line. You understand that? She put her whole life on the line. Had they found out what she did, she would have been dead and her family. So when she believed in Jehovah and helped those spies, it wasn't a casual belief. It wasn't, yes, I'll pray the sinner's prayer, and by the way, what are we having for dessert? Sometimes people approach salvation that casually. I hope you don't sound mocking that kind of an attitude. This woman, it wasn't casual. When she chose to cast her lot in with Jehovah, this God she had known nothing about except by rumors, had never met Jews before, when she chose to cast her lot in with this God that she just heard about by, rumor, by way of rumor, she was putting her whole life on the line, her whole life on the line, but she did it. We live in a nation filled with men and women who know all about the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and Peter, James, and John. And we don't cast our lives, our lives in with him at all. That's what makes her extraordinary. When it's tough to believe, she believed. It's easy for us to believe. We don't. For her, it was tough, and she did. And you wonder why she's in the Hall of Fame? I don't have any trouble with that. But I also know the work of the Holy Spirit. Anyway, our time's up. We're going to pick up with Rahab, one of my favorite women, one of God's favorite women, too. Father, we love you, we worship you, we thank you for being our God and loving us. We thank you for these great men and women who preceded us. I pray we learn from them. I pray we learn from the mistakes they made. Most of all, I pray, Lord, that we'll learn from their virtue. And their greatest single virtue is that they were devoted to you, and they were willing to die in the exercise of that devotion. What extraordinary men and women. I pray, Father, that we will appreciate them. Give us a good week. Bring us back safely next week to learn more from this wonderful book. In Jesus' name we pray.